This podcast is presented by Boeing, building a brighter future for all with the help of those who served. With support for hundreds of military and veteran-specific programs, Boeing offers opportunities and resources for a career in aerospace. Veterans can use the skills gained during their service directly in their next mission, leading teams in aerospace innovation. Boeing is proud to stand with and support those who served. Learn more about our veteran initiatives at boeing.com veterans. Got a fluid leak on the port wing. I think the column may be jamming on something. Left rudder pedal feels loose and I've only got right rudder. Compensate. I can't. Help me. I think we may be done. Start responding. We can manage it. We use throttles and rudder trim. It's too much. We need to bail out. Engine three is on fire too. Pilots and crew, get ready to bail. You son of a bitch. We are going to sit here and take it. You hear me? We're going to take it. Welcome back to the Masters of the Air podcast from the National World War II Museum. In today's podcast, we speak with one of the stars of Masters of the Air, Callum Turner, who plays Major John Egan. How you doing, Callum? I'm good, Cut. Nice to see you. Um, the, the key to our whole series, as we've been talking about now from the beginning, the key of this series is the relationship between John Egan and Gail Clevin. Tell us about the relationship between you and Austin Butler. What what developed through production when you guys met? You didn't know each other before. No, we didn't. Tell us about no. that. Oh, you mean on a personal level? On a personal level. As, I mean, without getting well, too personal. No, okay. Yeah. I keep, it, context, I keep it light. Within the context of clothing. <laughs> no, you know, the thing about Austin is that he's just the most incredible actor, actually. And I had so much respect for him going in. I'd seen him in Once Upon a Time and, uh, and had heard all about Elvis and... Um, I got his number, sent him a message, and three days later he sent me one back, and and then we just didn't stop, really, and we just connected immediately, and there was this passion from both of us to uh, do these guys justice and this story justice that we connected with immediately, um, and uh, I mean we hung out all the time. I remember one of the first days we went over to Hyde Park, and. I don't know what the game is called, but you throw the ball. It was like a version of baseball, and it's a very competitive game. Someone pitches it, someone hits it, and then three of you try and get it. I don't know what that game is called. It's a specific game. He knows the name. And um, we just bonded immediately, you know, and uh, were open to each other. And um, I think that passion and that determination to do these guys justice was the thing really that... The, the immediate thing that connected us. And then, you know, as we went along, we just were so open to each other. You know, as a scene partner, he's the most generous one I've ever had. We supported each other. For 10 months, the camera would be on him and then the camera would be on me, you know? And, uh, and there were a lot of days when I just went in and I wanted to make him laugh because that was John Egan. Uh, uh, trying to get a smile out of him or trying to get a smile out of Clevin was always a, a fun game for me to be playing. And um, along with along with all of the other guys, I would say too, you know, there is a real um, brotherhood, you know, between everyone in the cast and as it was in real life. And um, we also assumed these positions of majors. It's interesting what you said. Well, yes, we'll get into that now, the leadership, but... One of the hallmarks of the series, and, and a lot of people comment on the authenticity and that, you know, costumes and production design and et cetera. Mm. But maybe the most authentic thing about the series is, is, my, the, is my mustache. Absolutely, dude. Yeah. That was fabulous. Yeah. You, you, I knew you were going to say that. that. mustache like a <laughs> Errol Flynn. Um, no, what I was going to say is the authenticity of the brotherhood. Yeah, that's the that's the point. Talk a little, expand on that a little bit. I mean, that's the most important thing, you know. It's. Uh, 
um, that's what this show is about. It's about these guys going up into the air and, and supporting each other as a team to do something unprecedented, to win a war, to um, save our futures and, and, and provide a space for us to live freely. Uh, and um, that, I mean, doing anything like that, you create a bond. I've spoken to so many soldiers over the years who say that, you know, these people are like family as soon as you... Uh, leave your base. That, that's your that's your family, and um, life always imitates art. And when you're ten months into a job, eleven months into a job, you just get that for free. Um, and then, on a personal note, you know what John Hegan's character was like was this drinking, dancing, singing, incredible, uh, high energy, high octane human being. Um, and I really wanted to expand on those ideas because of what they were doing, you know, because they cared. And uh, <clears throat> that resonated with me because, um, you know, I've always played team sports and I've always cared passionately. When I play football, I, I hate losing. And um, I just tried to put that into this uh, because when you're playing on a football team or a soccer team, sorry, uh, you know, you're all trying to, you're trying to, uh, win the game and um, that's what these boys were doing on levels that were you know excruciatingly horrific Don Miller in, in the book Masters of the Air talks about Clevin and Egan being the heart and soul of the 100th Bomb Group and yeah. really the spiritual leaders they weren't although Egan was executive officer for a while they weren't really in command but in a way they were in command mm. and I remember on set there was something similar with, with you and Austin that there was just this thing where you guys were the leaders. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, once again, life, art mirroring life and mm -hmm. life mirroring art. Well, you know, the the hundredth, they were called the bloody hundredth. And they were called the bloody hundredth because they lost so many men. Also, they were so disorganized. LeMay wanted to get rid of them. He wanted to disband them and put the men into other groups. And in the midst of all of that, there were these two men that cared so deeply and passionately about keeping their uh, their brothers alive, um, that that kind of spearheaded this, you know, getting them back into line and 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 and, and changing their fates. And uh, yeah, life does imitate art, man. Austin and I were um, thirty and thirty-one when we when we did this, and we were probably the older ones out of all of the cast. Um, and, you know, when you have 18-year-olds, 19-year-olds, 20-year-olds running around on a movie set for the first time, they don't understand what it's like. And I imagine that would have been the same in, in the camps. And, and there were moments definitely where, especially because it was in the middle of COVID, you know, there was a lot of pressure to not get COVID, actually. And uh, sometimes some of the boys would take risks or, or, or misbehave or um, uh, not show up. And so we let them know that that wasn't what we were doing here. Uh, and because, again, as I said at the beginning, Austin and I cared. We really, really, really cared about this. And uh, no one was to step out of line. One of the things I've uh, w a lot of people have noticed about your performance is that, as you said, Egan, was he liked to drink and run around and he was in make jokes. And he was a character out of Damon Runyon, which mm. we could talk about. But what was interesting is that's who Egan is on the ground. Yes. In the air. And that was very, I mean, I, to me, that's so obvious in your performance. Talk about that dichotomy between Egan on the ground and Egan in the air. You know, one of the earliest bits of research that I discovered was that they say whatever your personality is, it goes times 10. So if you're Egan, you drink more, you dance more, you sing more, you go out more, because that's how you find solace in the trauma. And if you're Clevin, you you go into your shell more because that's who he was and he was a quiet man and thoughtful and pensive and, uh, and so that was the thing that was was just a um, such an exciting contrast for me because it meant that I could go further than, than I, I would have before to try and find that and, and ultimately what you're dealing with is grief you're dealing with PTSD you're dealing with losing people that you've seven hours before we're friends with on the ground, you know, and you could see and you could feel. And I think that's what is so extraordinary about this show, you know, is that 
that's what we're watching, the development of this PTSD in real time. And as the show goes on, you just get to see how, I mean, it's just the most traumatic thing in the world. Unprecedented warfare, 77% uh, of these men went down or were killed. And, um, you know, no, nowhere saw anything like it, you know, on the ground or in sea or even up until now. And, um, you know, that's what's, you know, to your point is, is what's so interesting. You know, they come home. They go into this extreme situation and then they come home. And how do you come home and have an, a normal life after that? I don't think you can, yeah. But they come home to the base and then they know they're going back up where they might die. It breaks my heart what these guys had to go through. It really does. And uh, and I'm so grateful to them for that. One of the, the themes of the, the series from the start was going to be to address, if not answer, the question, how did they keep getting back in those planes? Mm -hmm. After all of this, Callum, what do you, how, how would you answer that? How did John Egan, Gail Clevin, uh, Harry Crosby, et cetera, how did they keep getting back in the, after Regensburg, how do you get back into B-17? Um, I don't know. I, I don't know. They did what they had to do. Egan and Clevin joined up before Pearl Harbor. So they had something inherent inside of their soul that decided that they were, they were going to go and fight and they were going to go and um, save the world. And, uh, you know, lots of people joined up after Pearl Harbor, but they had something inside of them. And, um, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know how they would do that. What was interesting for me as an actor was I played this game with the plane and uh, I'd always be the last person to get into the plane and I'd build this friction between me and the plane um, because I knew that there's no way that that's an easy thing to do. There's, you know, to get into that thing and go up and it's just like a ticking time bomb. And if you come up, you're playing Russian roulette every time you go up there. And uh, yeah, it's just an extraordinary achievement of... of uh, of, um, you know. Yeah, we, all you can do, all we can do is try to hint at, and of course every man had their own individual, whatever they had to do in whatever internal process, and this is what, what the obviously the actor brings to us. But we can only infer how Crosby, how Rosie, how Egan got back into those plans. Mm -hmm. Did, was there any scene that you played that had a particular impact on you in any, in, in, in any episode? Mm, I mean, lots, yeah. Yeah, I'll bet. Um, you know, there's episode four for me, just in its entirety, is is um, is is an interesting. It just develops in a really fascinating way because that's when Egan's starting to lose his mind, and up until that point, you know, like you said, they had to um, do what they had to do, and they had to lead and. Um, this is just an unraveling of his of his mind and of his soul. The things that he's doing and how he's doing it is 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 really starting to crumble his insides. And he's drinking a lot, and uh, and uh, he takes the pass to go to London to try and escape it. And then by being in London, it's 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 even worse, you know. And I think I I guess to your other question about getting in the plane, it's because because they had an enemy. Mm. Because well, they, they had were an fighting against someone, and they had to, they had to save, they saved the world. They really did. They truly did. Yeah. They had an enemy, but they also had a brother, or brothers. They had nine other brothers, mm. and they, and we've read, and I'm sure you that so often they got kept getting back in the plane because, because Gail did, mm. and and Gail would get back in the plane because John did, mm. and et cetera, et cetera. Mm. Um, why do you think Clevin and Egan? Became as we show in the show, and as you and Austin portrayed, they were pretty different. And you even say that in the first scene. You know, first why are we scene, friends? Yeah. Why do you think they were friends? Um, because they connected one because they were fighting the fight, and they joined up uh, uh, early. Uh, two because they were pretty damn good at what they did. I mean, these are two of the best pilots around until Rosie comes and he has the reputation as being one of the best pilots too. And uh, I think there's just a deep, profound level of respect for one another. 
and they know that they are um, both going to be vital to the war effort and that um, they're both incredibly important to that. You know, that brotherhood is, is truly a special thing. And, uh, you know, Clevin, up until he died, talked about Egan and, and they just loved each other. And sometimes you have, you know, you make um, friends and, that, you know, there are friends for a reason, friends for a season and, and friends for life. And those two were, were best friends for life. Welcome back, my good friend Don Miller. Good to uh, see and talk to you again. It is, Kirk. So is we rolling? we uh, streamed or episode three, the Regensburg mission episode, and Regensburg Schweinfurt mission. I want you to tell us a little bit about that. That was pretty complex strategically and tactically, and um, and this was really a turning point in a way. I know, and last time we spoke, that just beginning of the combined bomber offensive was a turning point but this was also a turning point in a way that how, explain to us how the Regensburg Schweinfurt um effort signaled something new with the 8th Air Force this is exactly 1 year after the Air Force the 8th Air Force mounted its first mission uh to Rouen and uh the um they can now put a sizable force in the air you know and um they're going to bomb, in this case, since they don't have escorts, they have to have some way of protecting the bombers so that they can execute the mission. And they used a diversionary tactic in this case. Um, two bomb groups, two, two bomb divisions were going to fly. One division would fly. This is Curtis LeMay's division, which included the 100th. They will fly to uh, a city, first of all, deep inside Germany. This is the deepest penetration mission the 8th has undertaken in the war, okay? And uh, they're also going to hit a, um, it's almost a fetish at the time, uh, ball bearings. Uh, nothing can run industrial, industrially without ball bearings. This is their target of the moment. We will be in the first task force targeting the Messerschmitt 109 engine assembly plant in Regensburg. Second and third task forces will hit the ball bearing factories in Schweinfurt. And no war machine moves without ball bearings. If we succeed, we knock German production offline for months. There's no telling how many lives we could save. The ball bearing factories were in a town close to Regensburg called Schweinfurt. Uh, and that's gonna be the, the major target. The Regensburg mission is, is an aircraft production facility. It included the production of uh, some uh, embryonic uh, German jets. Uh, they didn't know that at the time. So it's, 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 it's a dual mission. And it's very complex. Uh, they start to use also, this is a breakthrough, they start to use group navigators. They found, LeMay found that rather than training uh, every bombardier and every navigator, he would have a group bombardier and a group navigator. And in, he he would take, that would be, they would be in the lead plane. And the bombers that followed would have not bombardiers, but togliers, they were called. And they simply bombed um, on a signal from the lead bombers. As soon as the lead bombers dropped smoke bombs and then real bombs, they would hit the switch and drop their bombs. The idea being that these guys could be highly trained and there's a more, and the bombing will be more accurate than it's been. So it's going to be more massive and more accurate. So we feel that we're now entering a new phase of the, of the bomber war where we can start taking out uh, the industrial infrastructure that supports the German war economy and uh, allows the invasion to take place if you can curtail fighter production. The day they're to take off, it's, it's misty. Um, there's a lot of cloud cover over the bases in England. And um, they were um, – the first, the first bombers in were going to be LeMay's bombers, and they were going to draw the Luftwaffe to them, okay? So they'll get hammered, allowing the other bombers to effectively bomb the Schweinfurt mission. 
their rough, the roughest part of the mission for that group would be returning from Schweinfurt without escorts, okay, and right through the fighter, the chief fighter zone in Germany. And a lot of the fighters, it was believed, will be diverted to um, the Regensburg mission. And that mission is going to bomb and then head to North Africa, all the way down the spine of the Alps uh, and uh, all the way down through Italy to North Africa. So that's the theory, you know, uh, the, you know and uh, – Well, there's a couple of things I want to follow up on because – uh, to, I want to talk more about the weather that morning why and why the first wing took off and well, the Le, second two didn't. LeMay, LeMay had been working – LeMay is the best bomber commander in the 8th Air Force. And his crews were probably the best trained. He's a guy who invented the, you know, the lead navigator idea. And they had been trained to take off and land in the, uh, in, in the goo, in the mist. And uh, – he was even thinking of training them for for for, uh, for night missions, so he had a lot more confidence in his crews. And as they're waiting on the tarmacs, these two groups are communicating with, with each other, and the high command has to make a decision um, to send to wait for the weather to clear. And it's getting late uh, in the morning, and they're not going to be able to bomb at night, or to send just one group down, send the LeMay group down, or just roll the dice, cut through the bad weather, and send both groups down. And the second in command, a guy named Anderson, makes that decision, Frederick Anderson. And uh, he decides that he's going to release the, um, the Regensburg uh, bombers. And so there were well over an hour. When you say ahead. release, you mean send. Send. Yeah. They use that term release. They send them to the target. So they go down and they they, they take staggering casualties on the way down. As they thought they would. They, um, the men started to see what they saw uh, thought were burning haystacks. And they're actually their B-17s that are knocked out of the sky. And they actually conducted a mission that was pretty successful in, its, in terms of accuracy. The bombardiers got got a good uh, you know using that toggleteer system, they they got a good read on the target and did some pretty serious damage to the fighter facilities, um, and um, Schweinfurt you know not as much, and uh, the Schweinfurt guys really took a hammering on the way on the way back. Well, so, how because they, they tr because the entire strategy has been thrown off kilter now exactly so. The Schweinfurt, um, how far behind? I mean, there were several hours, right, behind yeah. the, the first wing? The, yeah. the, the Schweinfurt wings were several hours behind the, the – Yeah, it was a little wing. further away, and they waited uh, till the weather cleared just a bit, just a bit. But it was still rough. It was The, the guys didn't think they were going to be able to fly, um, but uh, they made it to the target. And um, – well, let me. Uh, you said that you, they make it to the target, and I'm, we're, we're going to talk a lot more about this. But you mentioned North Africa. Why? Why were they? Why were they directed to instead of turning around and going back to Thorpe Ab or going back to England? I should say. Why were they sent to Thorpe? Ab I mean, to um, North so Africa. So the idea was maybe in the future you can run raids like this where you take fewer casualties, um, and uh, by peeling off. And going over Italian airspace, and then they can load up again in North Africa. Uh, the Twelfth Air Force is down there, um, and fly back to England. But on the way, bomb, it's called a shuttle mission. On the way back, on the shuttle part of it, you bomb another target. And they started to run these shuttle missions fairly regularly by 1944. Uh, they go. They go into Eastern Europe and, and run them. Actually, they ran a few out of Russia, and and at a place called Poltava. So that's the theory. Now the bombing was actually pretty effective, but the um, in the ball bearing factories, the um, the roofs caved in and they didn't destroy the machines, the actual uh, machines that the operators used to, to, to produce ball bearings. And they got that plant up and running pretty fast. But it scared 
the hell out of the Germans. They thought it was a bombing raid that we thought we were successful, and the Germans thought that they had really taken a hammering on this thing. Um, Speer reported to Hitler that if they run these kinds of raids in the future, and they run two or three of them, they stay in the chance of in a month or two of knocking us out of the out of the war. Now what? And he kind of mocks the Speer mocks the Americans in his autobiography for not following up one raid after the other after the other. And he said it, it was a repetition that, that eventually, later in the war, kills off German industry. It was a battle between destruction and reconstruction. And the Germans, for the longest time in the bomber war, win that. They reconstruct railroad tracks and everything very quickly. For a number of reasons we'll get into in later podcasts, they weren't able to do that anymore. But Speer was wrong to critique the Eighth Air Force because they couldn't run back-to-back -back missions because they took such a hammering and they didn't have enough for, for, of a force structure to really do a follow-up raid. Uh, the next big raid they would be able to do was in September, and that was back to Schweinfurt. And uh, so it, 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 it shows you how difficult uh, when the Air Force finally takes a cold-eyed look at this, they, they begin to see how difficult without escorts, it's going to be to knock out these plants um, because you can't knock out a plant in one raid, one cataclysmic raid. Right. You got to keep hitting them. You mentioned- Bad news for the crews. You mentioned um, the effect that weather played on the success or not of, uh, or failure of, of the Schweinfurt Regensburg mission, but weather was always a factor. Talk about that a little, tell us about that. And I think I remember in the book, you, I, for instance, in the in the late fall, if I'm and maybe early winter of forty three, there were almost no missions because the weather was so horrendous over England. Talk about the impact, or tell us about the impact of um, the well, weather. Well, um, there's weather systems all over Europe that affect you. For example, in England, there's usually low lying cloud cover and mist and rain. Okay, it's it's island weather. And it's capricious. Uh, so taking off is a problem. You can have, on the other hand, a very clear day in England and what looks like a clear day over the target, but Germany has a lot of the same kind of weather. It's almost perpetual cloud cover for most of the winter. So you get to the target and you find that the target's socked in. And then you got to go to, an, if you can do this, go to an alternative target. Then you got another problem. How's the weather on the way back? particularly over England, and how do you find your base? Because, you know, there's over 40 of these bases, like a checkerboard all across the East Anglian countryside, and it's very difficult to find your base. I talked to Ron Batley at Thor Babbitt's, and he said the lore was here that at one time in one raid, there were over 100 B-17s on a runway. They're just landing anywhere they could they could find uh, – just a, a, a glimmer of an opening through the clouds. So, so weather is weather is huge. Now, to you and me, um, it's um, it's a beautiful day. The sun's out and things like that. But that's a bad day for the bomber boys because they can be seen. They can be seen. Uh, they prefer to bomb through through cloud cover, and they develop instruments that allowed them. They thought to bomb more accurately than you would think uh, through cloud cover. The airmen had an interesting word for it. They called it women and children bombing and uh, because of its inaccuracy. All, all you could do is shoot a beam from a cathode tube instrument to the plane. You shot the beam down to the ground and the beam could pick up the difference between light and dark, water and land. That was it. That's how inaccurate that was. That was called H2X, and that, that, that was an aiming instrument. The British had instruments, too, that would take them actually to the target. They'd follow these beams to the target. Then there were bombing beams as well. So they're working on these. This is the idea of the bomber war being constantly experimental. In fact, the British, by the end of the war, are bombing more successfully at night, more accurately, than the Americans are bombing in the day. One of the, thing, the, other, one of the other problems that weather posed 
is just literally taking off. I know in our um, first episode that we saw last week, um, the, on the first mission, that first mission to Bremen, yeah, Clevin almost runs into another plane. Talk that. Tell us about how that worked. Well, I mean, you, 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 tell us how well, what well, they. The cloud cover is so thick. Um, I had a bombardier on one of my tours. I do these tours of you know the bomber bases, and he he was on tour, and I was trying to explain how the takeoff occurred, and somebody from the back of the bus said that's not quite right. And I go, well, who, well, who the hell is this? Well, he flew 34 missions as a bomb, you know, and he explained exactly how it was done. They would spiral up and spiraling up to try to get through this miles and miles of mist could take you up to two hours just to hit the clear air above the clouds. And you popped out of the clouds like a trout popping out of a stream. You know, there it is all of a sudden, you know. And uh, then you saw this multicolored plane up there. That was the goat that's going to take you to the target. And you assembled around that multicolored plane into groups. And the assembly took place for hours. And a lot of planes, if, 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 especially on from takeoff to the point where you pop out of the clouds, yeah, it takes two hours, but you're flying blind. You can't see anything. All you can hear, all you can do is, Listen to the engines of the planes behind you. And an awful lot of bombers crashed into one another, taking off. Yeah, you never think of it's, – it was dangerous even just trying to form up, just getting in the air. They, they lost over 10,000 guys to accidents in England, wow. in the training accidents. They were training all the time and uh, trying to get this down, you know. Um, they had a beam – uh, Splasher Six, it was it's called. It was still the. It was the newspaper of the Hundredth Bomb Group, and it was a radar beam. And they'd f try to fly around Splasher Six, and stay on that beam and guide them, guide them up into the sky. Um, but again, v deadly dangerous, deadly dangerous flying. Well, speaking of deadly dangerous, I think w the intention, our intention in production was to really begin to, and it was, as it was true in life, to let the Regensburg mission start to expose the audience to how horrific it really was, the experience of being in a B-17 on a, on a, on a bombing mission, particularly when, um, when it was that deep into Germany. So Regensburg, is, as you were saying, Don, really, because it was so deep into Germany, was really... This is was kind of a uh, a foreshadowing of what was going what was coming, and that was our intention in terms of the uh, of the show is to now you're going to start seeing what this is. We before we saw Bremen and that was rough, but they that was an aborted mission in episode one. And episode two was Tron time, and again it was rough, but it's really mainly about finding the target. Now in with the Regensburg episode, this is about the experience. This was about what it is, what it was, I should say, to be on a B-17, to be in any of those positions where you're helpless, as you had said previously, and yet you still have to follow your mission. How no horrendous. Yeah, how horrendous. Give us in that Don Miller manner. Tell us what it was like well, to be in a B-17. Well, you know, the, the plane's shaking like hell, for one thing, you know, and uh, it smells inside. Oil, piss, you name it, you know, sweat. And uh, the, um, and then you all of a sudden, the, you reach Hanover, Germany, which is on the German border with Belgium. And there the fighters, the little friends, as they were called, peel off and say, good luck, boys. You know, you're going in, you know, bareback on this, on this mission. And it's ours to the target going in and coming out, and you're in the heart of the German in the industrial system near the Ruhr Valley, and that's the heart of the fighter zones where they built these massive uh, um, airfields around, you know, production facilities like Schweinfurt and, 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 and Regensburg. Now these planes come in, and they're coming in in a different way. I, I, Adolf Galland, who was head of the German Fighter Command, started to change tactics. In the beginning, 
He said his boys, his flyers, were afraid of the Boeings. That's what he called them, uh, the B-17s. And they would go after the tail. But in climbing to get to the tail, they'd often allow the gunners on the 17s pretty good lines of fire, you know, as, as they were coming in. And he said, what we've got to do is be more accurate and we've got to terrify the gunners in such a way that, they, you know, that they're not going to be, their nerves are going to be shot. And so what they would do is they would approach the, the bombers on, they'd send a Staffel, a group of German fighters, maybe 12 on the, to, the, to the right of the plane, to the bomber, and 12 to the left. And they'd fly past them, but out of the range of their Browning machine guns on the bomber. So there are no danger of getting hit, but they're out there. It's like they're waving at them. Here we are. Then they go way out, like five miles, and they loop back. And the closing speeds are tremendous. Uh, the uh, B-17 might be flying at 240 miles an hour, and the German planes are flying almost at 400 miles an hour. That's a closing speed of jet, you know? And uh, so if you're sitting in a room and you see a fly on the wall, Okay, and uh, or a bug, and you, and you clap three times, he's there, he's on you, and that's how much time you had to prepare to aim and to hit. So, and they fly an on echelon in a line, and they're not going to hit the, the the rear. Obviously, they're going to hit the front. That's where everything essential is. The wings are filled with gas. That's where you kept the gas in the plane. You got the bombardier, the pilot, and things like that. People often ask me, well, what's the most dangerous position on the plane? It had to be the tail gunner all alone back there on his bicycle seat, you know, with his two machine guns or the ball turret underneath the plane. Well, it was by far, by far, uh, way, way uh, uh, more than anyone else, uh, the pilots, the pilots, beheadings and uh, horrible accidents inside the cockpit, pilot, co-pilot. Yeah. Well, speaking of pilot, co-pilot, um, there's a very famous... Major Clevin was made famous, nationally famous, on the Regensburg mission. He was. Tell us that story about the uh, the Ber Bernie. Tell us who Bernie Lay was. The article he wrote in the Saturday Evening Post, and um, what it told us about well, Gail Clevin. Bernie Lay um, was one of the founders of the Eighth Air Force. Seven men apparently, <laughs> and uh, and no planes. Uh, you know, uh, just before the, uh, when the, when they were formed at Savannah in January of 40, 42. So Lay's a high, a higher up in the Air Force, but he also flew. Uh, he, he flew missions and he wanted to fly on this mission and he flew from Thorpe Abbott's. And um, they moved him in, the, in such a way as they got him out of the way. Uh, he, he was uh, uh, tail end Charlie and uh, Probably was in one of the, initially one of the most dangerous positions in, in the formation. So he's an observer, and he's watching this aerial battle, this fighter fight taking place. And he has an eye on Clevin's plane, which is in front of him and just below him, a clear view. And like bees to honey, uh, the Germans would always pick a plane that was partially hit or crippled. And... Clevin got really banged up badly and started to drop, and, and he lost altitude and he lost speed, and they're ganging up and, and, and they're going to hit him. And the pilot hit the, bio, the bailout button, hit the bailout bell in this case, and the signal for everybody to either go out the bomb bay door or out the back door. And um, Clevin wasn't going to allow that to happen. So, um, well, explain that Clevin is the um, squadron commander. Well, so he, he's, he's in over. He's in charge of the squadron, so he, he can he, overrule. He is in charge of the mission. Yeah, yeah. He, he's 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 the commander, and uh, a lot of the commanders flew in what they call the second seat or the co-pilot seat, um, and the um, so. His decision is the ultimate decision. You know, you're not going to overrule him. So uh, I'm not going to name the name of the. I think it's unfair to name the name of the pilot, um, but he wanted. He he thought the plane was um, taking too much damage and wouldn't survive to the bomb. Survive to the bomb run, and so he hits the bomb. Out, you know the bell. People begin to prepare to, to jump out of the planes. And by the way, just an aside, nobody had ever jumped out of a plane before, 
Nobody had ever been trained. Nobody had ever been taught how to do it. They were taught how to pull the ripcord. Okay, that's our first experience with a parachute. So anyway, um, Clevin suppose, grabs him by the arm and said, you know, you know, you're it's a little unclear because it comes through in different stories and, and Gail's told it to me in different ways. But basically he says, the hell with this. We're sticking to the bomber. We're not bailing out. We're going to bomb the target and we're going to return to England. And Lay hears this um, and over the radio system. There's two radios on a plane. They, because they were in trouble, they were radioing back, you know, so whether they're going to turn around, go back to England or not. And there's this little throat mic where you can talk to the crew. Lay could hear what was going on inside the plane. He's almost like in the plane. So um, when the mission's over, um, he he calls his friends at, you know, in, in, at the Saturday Evening Post. And he writes an article about the raid. Talking about all the kinds of things that made it, you know, a, a breakthrough kind of raid, you know. And, uh, and but mostly talking about Clevin. Um, Clevin should have had won an air medal for this. And uh, he supposedly did, but he never picked it up. He said, hell, what I needed was an aspirin, not a medal. And uh, but this is the legend now of uh, he, he had already had a legendary reputation as an exquisitely skilled pilot and, and a command pilot. Now there's this, and, uh, and he, his reputation is compounded, and he becomes a national hero. Well, the Saturday Evening Post, let's remind people, was- It's read by everybody. It's an interesting, as a personal aside, I know that that story, so the story is called I Saw Regensburg Bombed right. by Bernie Lay. Uh, and it was republished many years ago by the American Library. In a compendium That's called, right, it was, yeah. a, a, a called um, Reporting World War II. I know that that story, when Tom Hanks read that story, that's the initial story that got him interested in portraying the war in the air. Now, this was many years ago. It was I think it was between Band of Brothers and the Pacific. But it was that story that told Tom that – there is something really dramatic here, and it isn't a push-button war. The other thing, of course, is Bernie Lay is really known for, is that he wrote the novel 12 O'Clock High, High, and then co-wrote the screenplay of 12 O'Clock High, which I think you agree with me, is easily the best movie oh, yeah. about not just the 8th Air Force, until now, of course, um, but is maybe, might, might be the best movie about World War II I've ever seen. And there's precious little combat. Very little. It, in fact, most of the combat footage, if not all of it, was actually stock War Department footage. It was such a great movie starring Gregory Peck, who just defined the role um, of, of Colonel Armstrong, that um, or Savage. I'm sorry. His name, the character name was Frank Savage. It was based on Armstrong. The psychological turmoil that these yeah. men were in. It, it is almost very little f physical combat. It's all the psychological and emotional combat the men had with themselves. Well, there are stories about guys that did get back in the plane after a horrendous raid and cracked again immediately. Um, I interviewed a guy named Sherman Small at the uh, Savannah Museum, the 8th Air Force Museum, and it was a riveting interview. And... Uh, he was in the tail uh, of the 17, and the Germans had a practice later in the war of uh, uh, flying kamikaze missions where they would crash into the uh, American bombers. There's a spot in the spine of the bomber where if you hit it straight on, you can cut the bomber in half. It's right near the rear stabilizer or, or, or tail of the plane. So the plane's split in two, and he's in the back compartment. Uh, as a tail gunner, and he can't get out. He has a parachute, but he can't even punch himself out. Now, that's a thin-skinned plane, too. It's only aluminum, you know. That's why flak was so dangerous. It could just – a guy with a screwdriver can just – and a hard punch can, you know, knock the screwdriver right through the thing. But he couldn't get out. He dropped from twenty two to 23,000 feet and lived and lived. They sent him up later in the week on another mission. And when he went up, we interviewed him, and um, um, he um, 
I said, well, what happened? He said, I don't know exactly what happened. I can tell you the long-term result. He said, I, as soon as we got over uh, Holland, he said, I felt the tail kind of swaying, you know, and I thought it was going to break off. And that's the last thing I remember. For a year and a half, he was taken off the plane like a frozen Wisconsin log, put into the base hospital. They couldn't handle it there. They gave him sodium pentothal, sodium amethyl, blah, 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 blah. And they sent him to the major hospital at Oxford. Um, they couldn't handle him there. They shipped him back to Don Carlos Hospital in Florida, and he was in a coma for that long a period of time and uh, recovered and became a very successful businessman and a whole human being again. But can you imagine um, experiencing that? And, and then being asked to do it again. And then we talk about support systems and how important it was to have other crewmen in an earlier episode. But let me make this point. One place the guys would go for solace uh, because they're traumatized by this, uh, the idea of flying. And um, they could go to their priest or their minister on base. Um, there, wasn't, there weren't Jewish rabbis. Um, the, or they could go to the, um, to the local combat surgeon, you know, Rusty Stover, you know, and uh, and we'll talk about bear the, witness to what, what what was going on. Yeah, you say combat surgeon, but in the book, and I think again, it's 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 so. Tell us about the the combat surgeon because he played many roles. He wasn't yeah, a, a, the surgeon. That's a misleading uh, title in a, in a way. Well, first of all, he wasn't a real surgeon. Uh, most of these guys were not physicians. Okay, they were like nurses' assistants today. Uh, they had plenty of psychiatrists in England, but generally these guys only flew for observation and things like that. If they have a plethora of breakdowns and things like that, but he handles at the base hospital what they would what we would call maybe a, a light wound, maybe a frostbite, something like that. It just what they would do is they'd wait for the Russian cure to. to set in and that was the the fingers would turn um, black and then purple and they'd fall off and then you could start to work with it you know and uh, they could handle things like that uh, but they also had to handle and this comes through in 12 o'clock high they had to handle psychiatric cases now the commander his job the base commander who's in charge of the whole operation um, he's under pressure to get results he can't keep losing guys to combat fatigue or get a reputation as a base where guys break down. So there's a lot of de-emphasis in Air Force records, uh, cleansing of the records, actually. Um, and uh, so we'll never really know how many guys actually broke down. The numbers are around 2,200, but I would say it's more like 8,000. But the his job was uh, really tricky uh, in that the guys confided in him, and um, and yet, and I've talked to combat surgeons and uh, and chaplains as well, and uh, they say, well, our job was to settle the guy down, get him thinking right again, get him in a condition where he's able to fly again and experience the same conditions that got him here in the first place. So. Well, it's interesting. We, you and I have talked about it. There's another Gregory Peck movie called Captain Newman, M.D., Yes, which is a wonderful movie. It's not quite a, of the caliber of 12 O'Clock High, but it's about a Air Force hospital stateside, I believe in Arizona, and that Gregory Peck character in this movie does just that, only he is a real psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. And they make the point, and there's a particular storyline where – he meets a young man who was a gunner on a B-17 and went through a traumatic experience. He sent stateside to um, to be cured, and he is cured, only, of course, to be sent back into combat. And we won't t I won't tell you what happens, but you can imagine. And the dilemma that poses to the Gregory Peck character, wh why, why do I make – why do I help cure them? If I'm just going to send them back to what made them sick in the first place. So that the dilemma that, a, in this case, a psychiatrist, but the flight surgeons had, as you're describing. Some of the flight surgeons toward the end of the war admit 
to Air Force High Command that the only words that will truly settle a guy down are you don't have to fly again ever. And you're on the way to recovery. <laughs> but um, yeah. is there any particular – we purposefully set most of episode three in the air. You're with – you're with the men in those B-17s for the majority of the episode. Anything, any sequence uh, to stick out to you that? Uh, for well, again, I mean, how much men have to, do, the crewmen have to depend on other crewmen for everything. The uh, There you really see, uh, for want of a better term, the companionship and t teamwork that's absolutely essential to run a, to run a mission, you know. You had to be able to count on everybody. And what made it really difficult, um, we don't do a, have a big deal about this, but what made it really difficult for a lot of crews was when um, a guy would get on the plane, maybe he's his, this is his 24th mission, and he's really sick. And he's sick to the point where he's a non-functioning person on the plane. You know, he's a cipher. And uh, do you allow him on and so he can complete his missions and go home? Endangering the other nine guys uh, by protecting him? Uh, or do you say to him, no, Joey, you know, you got to get yourself fixed up because you're, you're part of a team here and we need 10, not nine. Uh, so the crews had to make that decision. What's interesting in episode three, as we showed, uh, Major Egan was actually not assigned, but somehow, I'm not sure it's clear exactly how he got himself assigned to that mission. And we show him, and this did happen, um, he went down into the nose and was part, joined the, the bombardier and the yeah, navigator yeah. and was uh, acting as a gunner. Uh, and as we show, I think accurately, all the guys are mystified by that, his friends. How'd you... How'd you get on here as a passenger, you know? But and, you can pull rank like that at a small base. And and and, 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 and the 100th was a pretty loosely run operation, you know? Uh, Why do you and, think he did that, though? In other words, this is one he could have avoided. By this point, he's a squadron commander. He didn't have to go up. In fact, it was he wasn't supposed to because that put four squadron commanders on one mission, and that was yeah. verboten. Yeah, it was but verboten. he did it anyway. Why, why do you think? I have absolutely no idea. And... Uh, what what he's thinking, and uh, by taking that uh, by taking that risk, yeah. Well, I mean, I wonder because again, he used to refer to he he obviously knew that this was going to be a very difficult, the most dangerous mission to date, and he always, as you said in the previous podcast, about him writing the letters to uh, to the families of the of the men who were missing, um, and he referred to he, he referred to them as. My boys. I know Clevin in episode two, he, and I, he did say this, um, you know, how, he and Egan are talking like, how are we going to do this? When they realized how dangerous daylight bombing was, and Egan says something to the effect, how are we going to do this? And Clevin said, um, we lead our, we lead our men, we lead our boys through it. And that was, that was their ethos. We have to, they've been together since 1940 and they've been the spiritual, if not the actual leader of the hundredth from the beginning. And I think they took that leadership role so seriously. And I, I think, and you tell me what you think. I think that's, uh, Don, that was part of the, 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 the magnet between the Clevin so. and Egan. They recognize within each other. The lead, the the great leader that the other was, and not just for themselves, but leading. Egan knew he needed Clevin to lead his boys, and Clevin knew he needed Egan to lead his mm -hmm. boys. And I think that was a big part of their relationship. And just like the combat surgeons, guys like Clevin, um, who didn't drink, um, were always in the bar with the guys available. Um, and the combat surgeons were largely there to watch for manifestations of what was called euphemistically combat fatigue and excessive aggressiveness, um, a little sexual craziness, uh, Parkinson's like shakes and things like that, repetition of words and things like that. Because the Air Force ha 
to break down in combat in the Air Force, you manifested different symptoms than combat troops did on the ground. An infantryman, for example, could start to show some, some symptoms. But generally, it was a result of long-term stress and the longevity of combat. They, they had it mapped out to such an extent. They said an army truck, you could get about 50,000 miles on an army truck, and you could get about 130 days of steady combat, and the guy is done. I don't care what kind of what, – what he's a, a John Wayne-type character or an American Western or, or whatever, just a scared PFC. Um, he, he, will, he will be ineffective, and eventually he will break. It happens to everybody. Um, Churchill, uh, Churchill's surgeon, uh, Lord Morin, uh, served in World War I as a combat um, surgeon. And uh, he wrote a book uh, called The Anatomy of Courage. Uh, I have a chapter of that title. I was very taken with the book. And he said, what is courage? That's the first question you have to ask. He said, y you have it. But if you have it, it's not there all the time. But uh, it usually you bank it. And when you, the problem with courage is you have a bank account, but the, the minute you use it, you lose it. And you're not you likely to be courageous again. You only have so much, and then you can't take it anymore. And he said, and that's true of combat as well. You can be an Audie Murphy on the line, you know, and, and just a screaming banshee of a killer. And... Yeah, um, it's uh, John Hersey wrote a great novel on that called The War Lover. It wasn't much of a movie, Steve McQueen movie, but it's the best. I think it's better than 12 O'Clock High and uh, as, as a novel on the 8th Air Force. As a novel, but not a movie. No, terrible movie. <laughs> No, but let's continue the point in, is that that idea that courage, you have this bank account. Yeah. You have only so much courage in your bank account. And every time you make a withdrawal, you have that much less. Yeah. And there's no such thing as an unlimited bank account. Don, we're going to wrap it up there for this week. We are three episodes in. We have several more to go. Don, again, thank you so much for your insight, for your knowledge. Oh, thank your, you, your, Kurt. Your, your, the book and everything. And we will see everybody next week after episode four. Fantastic. In the next podcast, we speak to executive producer Gary Getzman. I mean, it's thousands of people, you know, when you're uh, making locations represent the 1940s, when you're building sets uh, for this kind of magnitude of star, which is the plane. It's one of those where I think about it and I go, man, yeah, we, it was huge. I mean, we had four call sheets a day going of where people were taking care of business and rehearsals and and it was uh, it was huge. The final word on today's podcast belongs to one of the real flyers of the 100th Bomb Group, Robert Wolf, who flew on the Regensburg mission. I guess Regensburg was the first major loss they had. They lost nine out of 18 planes. They lost half the group, but uh, now I can remember that one. And we went across the channel and and we got to the coast and wham, we got attacked right now and it kept up for the next two hours. And uh, I can still see planes going. I, I saw one plane go down. A plane was coming out of every window in the cockpit. And the waste went, everything was, was on fire in that plane. And that memory has stuck in my head since since that day, but there were planes going and coming. There was flak, there was fighters, more flak, more fighters, they would alternate. And I could hear the top turret chattering away with machine gun fire. It was not a, the greatest, ex it was a great experience, but it's not one I want to ever repeat. I mean, we had 
similar things later on, but that one really scared the wits out of me. I knew what combat was like, yeah. You can hear more oral histories from the 100th Bomb Group from the National World War II Museum's online collection, available on the National World War II Museum's YouTube channel. Masters of the Air is an Apple original series from executive producers Steven Spielberg, Tom Hanks, and Gary Getzman, now streaming on Apple TV+. Click the link in the podcast show notes to watch Masters of the Air, starring Austin Butler and Callum Turner.